Greetings and welcome back. We are now in Senior English B and we are working with our final observations and comments on Keats. The first place we're going to go is to page 867 in your hymnals where we're going to spend some time talking about this uh, final observation from this work of art. Beauty is truth, truth, beauty. And then Keats's observation to follow, that's all you know on earth and all you need to know. And then after we do that, we're going to spend a little time with the other two offerings of Keats. And if I have time, I'll spend time with the other three that are on that handout page. Make a note to yourself. The examination of tomorrow will not have questions over those three poems on that handout page. They will not. Now, they've got to be included as part of the annotation packet six of coming on Monday of next week, but you're not going to see any exam questions over those. So that is to say, if you want to prep for the exam, you're prepping on the following poems. When I have fears that I may cease to be, Ode on a Grecian Urn, Autumn, and Nightingale. That's the four poems that you're going to receive questions on. Everybody gritty with what I just said. Let's now go to Ode on a Grecian Urn. Ode on a Grecian Urn is a poem. By the way, now you'll understand that comic on the outside of my door, huh, that some students stuck up there. If you haven't seen it, take a look at it after class. It's posted right on the other side of my door, on the front door. Keats is looking at a work of art. He asks a series of questions about that work of art to it. He's actually is speaking directly to it. He will ask, for example, I wonder what's going on with this guy and this girl. They're just about to kiss, but they're not quite there. He says to the kids, don't be sad because you're never going to grow old. You're always going to be young and forever young, and you're always going to be able to therefore always seem kind of like your uh, enthusiastic, energetic young. For example, he says, the trees, think about it this way, none of the trees are losing their leaves because they're a work of art, and that means they are forever, if you will. Um, I wonder, he says, I wonder what's going on with these people walking out, of the, uh, walking out of the town, leading a cow out to do some kind of sacrifice like the Greeks used to do in the spring in what was called the Dionysian Festival, or the Bacchian, Bacchian Festival. Finally, we get to the last stanza. If I had more time, I'd spend more time with this. I don't, I don't so I'm going to go right now to it. I'm on page 867. Oh, attic shape. I'm putting, I'm putting information now in your notes, what that means. Oh, attic shape. It just simply means it comes from this place called Greece. Fair attitude. That means a beautiful work of art. With breed of marble men and maidens overwrought, with forest branches in the trodden weed. All that we already know. Basically, that's what's on the outside of the urn. Thou silent form. Why is it silent? Write it down. Why is it silent? Why is a work of art silent? Right, Mikey's painting doesn't speak, or does it? See, that's going to be the irony of this poem. The work of art doesn't speak, or does it? Notice at the beginning of the stanza, he calls it a silent form. At the end of the stanza, he has this work of art speak. And what does it say? That's in quotation marks. We'll get to it. Does tease us out of thought. Tease here simply means to challenge us to think. Write it down, he says, Great works of art challenge us to think, as doth eternity. When you start thinking, for example, about forever and forever, you start asking lots of questions, as does a work of art. Here, though, cold pastoral means this is a work of art. It's not animate. It doesn't have the ability to actually talk out loud. But if it did, keep reading, when old age shall this generation waste, in other words, Keats is aware that long after he's dead and gone, this work of art remains. It was there 1,500 years before Keats was born. It's going to be around long after his generation is gone, wasted. Keep going. Thou shalt remain. This work of art's going to stay. In midst of other woe than ours, a friend to man to whom thou sayest. This work of art, which was silent a few lines above, now is ready to speak and what does it say? Beauty is truth. Truth, beauty. That's what the work of art says. Do you see the quotation marks? That's what the work of art says. Keats follows that up, note the hyphen, by saying, that is all you need to know. What is all you need to know? 
What is all you need to know? Beauty. This line, beauty is truth, truth, beauty. That is all you need to know on earth. And all, I'm sorry, that's all that you know on earth. And all you need to know. In other words, Keats will say, the only thing humans can ever really know is this fact. Now, question. Is it true that all beautiful things are true? Well, we pointed out yesterday, not always. So how do you explain this line? The only way to do it, and now I'm on my whiteboard, the only way to do it is to go back to an idea that we were working with before when we were working with Tintern Abbey. And I'm going to do this, and hopefully this will start to bring back some memories. It's one of the reasons why I play this game. As soon as I do it, Rod Lutner class snaps his finger. Right. So in other words, where does this come from, though, Rod Lutner? Do you remember? It comes from a great Greek philosopher. What was his name? Do you remember Socrates or Plato? We called it the theory of the forms. All right? Above the first box, we'll put the word images. Above the second box, we'll put what word? Do you remember? Pl Plato used the word forms, but what other word? Do you remember? Idea, good. Idea, concept, right? Do you remember this? And for example, in the first box, we could put, for example, a beautiful face or a beautiful body, correct? Uh, Victoria's Secret model was, what, uh, was who Judice was uh, fantasizing about. Then we said there's a difference between the beautiful body of a Victoria's Secret model, right? Because we know about that beautiful body, sooner or later, everything sags and bags. Remember we said that. And there's going to be somebody that will pay her money to go, honey, no, no, nobody wants to see lingerie on you anymore. You just keep the robe on. Nobody, right? Sooner or later. That's what we know about beautiful physical bodies. They all go, they're all going to decay. We know that. Inevitably, what happens ultimately to the beautiful Victoria's Secret model? Right. She gets buried in the ground. I mean, you want to dig her body up after three months in the ground. She ain't going to look like no Victoria's Secret model, right? We know this intuitively. And yet, we're also aware of this thing called beauty, correct? Right now, touch beauty. Well, I'd like to touch a Victoria's Secret model. No, no, no. You'd be touching a body that's beautiful. But what about beauty? I want to touch that. Yeah, well, you don't understand. That's not something you touch. That's actually kind of an idea or a concept. If you will, it is formless. Isn't that right? There's no form to it, right? It is meta. This simply means beyond physical, right? It's beyond the physical, right? Beauty, it's beyond the physical, of the physical body, right? And then you'll remember we played some more games about this. For example, we said Ruthie's tree out in the courtyard. Remember, all of these things are related to the five senses, correct? Ruthie's tree, you can see, touch, taste, it, et cetera, et cetera. But there's a difference between Ruthie's tree and this thing we're going to call nature with a capital N or energy, right? Right, or energy. Remember, we played this game as well. Plato plays this game talking about human bodies, versus spirit or soul, again, energy, right, okay. All of the stuff in this box, are you looking at my whiteboard now? I'm helping you understand Oda and Gratian Urn. All of the stuff in this box, meta or beyond the physical. The, the, uh, in junior English, you remember last year, the Americans called this what? What did Emerson and Thoreau call this? They didn't speak always of metaphysics, they called it what? They used a different word, trans, which means beyond, Transcendental. transcendentalism. It's the same concept. In other words, there's this stuff in the first box, but then there's this stuff in the second box, but you can't see, touch, taste it. It's beyond the senses. And yet somehow we have a sense that it actually does exist, right? We have a sense that it's real. It's just something you can't actually touch, right? So, for example, watch this. We can put here brain. We know that you have a brain. Right? Okay, Ramos, we do know that. Uh, your brain, right? Okay? But that's not the same thing as your mind. If I cut open your brain, I can't find your mind. And yet your mind is listening to my words right now, and you're processing them on some level. You're thinking about them on some level. Where is that? Where is your mind? Well, we know it's a, something has something to do with your brain. Right? But this is not that confusing. Walk onto any job site. Construction site, I want to touch electricity. I want to see it. 
Yeah, see, no, no, you guys are like, no, you don't understand. What do you mean you don't understand? There's lighting. Obviously, it's there. Yeah, right, it's there. Well, then if it's there, I ought to be able to touch it. No, no, you see, you don't understand. You can't touch. I want to touch magnetic power. Uh, no, you don't, no, no, you don't understand. I want to touch beauty. I want to touch truth. I want to touch freedom. Right? Do you got me? Now, go back to Lola. Hello, Lola. Now I'm ready to ask one more question and we'll be done. This is called what? The title of this poem is called what? Ode. Ode. We got that one. He's speaking directly to something. The other word is an, a, an apostrophe, right? A ode on a what? <laughs> Grecian urn. We said Grecian means comes from the country of Greece. Urn is that thing that holds ashes of somebody that's died and been you know, consumed in fire, whatever, on a funeral pyre. Ode on a Grecian urn. Okay, question. Let's call G-U as Grecian urn. Can we do that? Where are you going to put the Grecian urn? In which box are you going to put the Grecian urn? Clearly, you're going to put it here, right? I mean, that just makes sense. You can see it, taste it, touch it, etc. Kate's been looking at it. Well, then, if that's what goes in the first box, Miss Benitez... What goes in the second box? If a beautiful body goes in the first box, then the word beauty goes in the second box. If Ruthie's tree goes in the first box, but the word nature or energy goes in the second box. If the body goes in the first box and spirit soul goes in the second box. If brain goes in the first box and mind goes in the second box. If Grecian urn goes in the first box, what goes in the second box? Art. Yeah. Who said art? Yeah. Outstanding, Rock Luke. Right? With a capital A, a capital R, a capital T. Does that make sense? Right? It's kind of like a musician once said, uh, Bob Marley, I knew who said this, there were other great musicians who said this, the music is not in the notes, but in the silence between the notes. Now that is interesting. The music is not in the notes, but in the silence between the notes. That's where the real music lies. Well, now, again, we're playing a game with art, aren't we? And what is it that we learn when we look at great works of art? Are you ready for this? Watch my whiteboard. We learn what? Beauty is truth. Truth is beauty. That's all... You know on earth and all you need to know. This is another way to simply say, spending your time around works of art, Grecian art, you begin to identify the value of the stuff in the second box. And the stuff in the second box is all kind of equal. You can't touch beauty. You can't touch truth. And yet, we know they exist somehow. How do we know they exist? Works of art tell us so. They show it to us. The power of the Grecian urn is it reminds us of what's really important in life. If you spend all of your time worrying about the stuff in the first box, you're never going to be a very happy person. And you're certainly not going to know very much. Why? Because all the stuff in the first box does what? It all does what? Well, it's related to the five senses. It sags and bags. It goes away. It changes. It ultimately goes away to death, right? But look at Keats. A thousand years before he was born, that work of art was created. And there it still is. And long after this generation shall waste away, he says this work of art will still be talking. Even though it's silent, it'll still be talking. And what will it say? Beauty is truth. Truth, beauty. In other words, the stuff in the second box is all you ever really need to know about. That's enough. If you know this stuff, you can live a happy life. Because where would you put the word happy? In the first box or the second box? Can't touch happy. Can't touch happy, can you? Right? We talked about this, right? People will, for example, do all kinds of narcotics, not because they love dope, but because they want freedom. Where are you going to put freedom in those two boxes? You ain't going to put freedom in the first box. Right? You ain't going to put freedom in the first box. Make sense? Observations, questions, concerns? Let's keep going now. I don't have a lot of time, but I want to try and help you get ready for the examination. And the way I'm going to do that now is to have you quickly go to, first of all, um, the poem to Autumn on page 864. So go there now. 
I'm going to say a couple of things for your notes about this poem on, on 864, and then we'll uh, and then we'll go to work. All right. What I want you to point out for yourself on 864 is that this is a poem that talks about the time of the year that we call the fall, correct? Autumn or the fall. And I want you to point out for your notes that Keats describes autumn. Kitchen freshman, last names M through Z. Please report to the Commons for pictures. Freshman, M through Z. Keats describes autumn. Keats describes autumn using all five of the senses. Every time there's something about that that's elicited, what you can see, touch, taste, hear, smell, write it down real quickly. Take a look at this. To autumn, John Keats. Season of mists and mellow fruitfulness, closed bosom friend of the maturing sun, Conspiring with him how to load and bless with fruit the vines that round the thatch eaves run. To bend with apples the mossed cottage trees, and fill all fruit with ripeness to the core. To swell the gourd and plump the hazel shells with a sweet kernel. To set budding more and still more later flowers for the bees, until they think warm days will never cease, for summer has o'erbrimmed their clammy cells. Who hath not seen thee oft amid thy store? Sometimes whoever seeks abroad may find thee sitting careless on a granary floor, thy hair soft lifted by the winnowing wind, or on a half-reaped furrow sound asleep, drowsed with the fume of poppies, while thy hook spares the next swath and all its twined flowers. And sometimes, like a gleaner, thou dost keep steady thy laden head across a brook, or by a cider press, with patient look, thou watchest the last oozings hours by hours. Where are the songs of spring? Ay, where are they? Think not of them. Thou hast thy music too, while barred clouds bloom the soft dying day and touch the stubble plains with rosy hue. Then in a wailful choir, the small gnats mourn among the river sallows, borne aloft or sinking as the light wind lives or dies. And full-grown lambs loud bleat from hilly bourne, hedge crickets sing, and now with treble soft, the red breast whistles from a garden cross and gathering swallows twitter in the skies. Autumn has its song, just like spring has its song. Different songs, obviously. <clears throat> just like um, Shelley's Ode to the West Wind, the fall, of course, everything is starting to die. Look, Ruthie's tree's leaves are turning orange and brown. Soon they will all fall off. And yet, Keats points out, there's something quite beautiful and majestic about fall, autumn, just like there is about spring. When you go back to review this poem for your exam, pay particular attention to all of the different ways that the five senses are elicited. Now go to page 868, Ode to a Nightingale. Write this down. A nightingale is a bird that sings in the night. So we often will compare this poem with another poem that was an ode to a bird. Whose was it and what did it say? Do you remember? Shelley's Skylark. Good. Notice in this poem two things. The speaker, Keats, will kind of envy two things. The happiness or the joy of the bird and the longevity or the way the bird can live even after him, remember Keats himself aware that soon he must die, correct? Listen to it. Ode to a Nightingale. Follow along. John Keats. Teacher, Keats. sorry for this interruption, but as you probably have found out, my it's not yet if an account is down. So as soon as you get back up, we'll let you know. As though of hemlock I had drunk, or emptied some dull opiate to the drains one minute past, and lethe words had sunk. Tis not through envy of thy happy lot 
but being too happy in thine happiness, that thou light-winged dryad of the trees, in some melodious plot of beech and green and shadows numberless, singest of summer in full-throated ease. Oh, for a draught of vintage, that hath been cooled a long age in the deep delved earth, tasting of flora and the country green, dance and provincial song and sunburnt mirth. Oh, for a beaker full of the warm south, full of the true, the blushful hippocrine, with beaded bubbles winking at the brim and purple-stained mouth, that I might drink and leave the world unseen and with thee fade away into the forest dim. Fade far away, dissolve, and quite forget what thou among the leaves hast never known, the weariness, the fever, and the fret. Here, where men sit and hear each other groan, where palsy shakes a few <coughs> sad last gray hairs, where youth grows pale and spectre thin and dies. Sags and bags. Where but to think is to be full of sorrow and leavened-eyed despairs. Where beauty cannot keep her lustrous eyes, or new love pine at them beyond tomorrow. Away, away, for I will fly to thee, not charioted by Bacchus and his pards, but on the viewless wings of poesy, though the dull brain perplexes and retards. Already with thee tender is the night, and haply the queen moon is on her throne, clustered around by all her starry fays. But here there is no light, save what from heaven is with the breezes blown through verdurous glooms and winding mossy ways. Top of page 870. I cannot see what flowers are at my feet, nor what soft incense hangs upon the boughs. But in embalmed darkness, guess each sweet wherewith the seasonable month endows the grass, the thicket, and the fruit tree wild, white hawthorn, and the pastoral eventime, <coughs> fast fading violets covered up in leaves, and mid May's eldest child, the coming musk rose, full of dewy wine, the murmurous haunt of flies on summer eaves. Darkling, I listen, and for many a time I have been half in love with easeful death, called him soft names in many amused rhyme to take into the air my quiet breath. Now more than ever seems it rich to die, <coughs> to cease upon the midnight with no pain, while thou art pouring forth thy soul abroad in such an ecstasy. Still wouldst thou sing, and I have ears in vain, to thy high requiem become a sod. Thou wast not born for death, immortal bird. No hungry generations tread thee down. The voice I hear this passing night was heard in ancient days by emperor and clown. Perhaps the selfsame song that found a path through the sad heart of Ruth. When sick for home, she stood in tears amid the alien corn. The same that oft times hath charmed magic casements, opening on the foam of perilous seas in fairy lands forlorn. Forlorn, the very word is like a bell to toll me back from thee to my soul self. Adieu, <coughs> the fancy cannot cheat so well as she is famed to do, deceiving elf. Adieu, adieu, thy plaintive anthem fades past the near meadows, over the still stream, up the hillside, and now tis buried deep in the next valley glades. Was it a vision or a waking dream? Fled is that music. Do I wake or sleep? One final comment before you leave. Keats knows he's dying, so he, he sees everything in his life through that prism or that lens. When he hears this songbird at night singing in the dark, he cannot help but think about how death is like night coming on. And how the bird's song reminds him that everything must go. And yet, 
for some reason, music seems to have a magic power, right, to kind of continue to elevate his soul. So that by the end of the poem, notice, he doesn't seem to be really unhappy about going, about dying, but rather maybe more like, I always knew this was going to happen. In the same way that you know, by virtue of the fact that when you were a kid, you always had to leave the park and go to the van. You couldn't stay there forever and swing, even though you wanted to, right? Sooner or later, we all got to go to the van, right? Thank you.